For Krumah Media's Policy, I'm Tabi Shomulikai, AC Jordan Chair and Director of the Center for African Studies at the University of Cape Town, Suren Pillay, joins me to unpack his book titled Predicaments of Knowledge, Decolonization and Deracialization in Universities. Your book explores the difficult questions facing South African universities after apartheid. So can you tell us what are some of these questions and what does a decolonized uh, curriculum look like? As you know, there was a dramatic moment in 2015, 2016 that started at the University of Cape Town, mm -hmm. known as the Rose Must Fall moment that was led by students who were asking questions about what we teach in our universities so many years after the formal end of apartheid in 1994. And there have been scholars who have been asking the same question for a number of years, but it has not been widely taken up, widely debated in the way that it was when the students put it on the agenda. For a long time, as I suggest in the book, we've been focused on the important question of who gets into the university, because the university, as we know it, excluded the majority of South Africans in terms of access, in terms of uh, the kind of fees that we would have to pay. So these economic questions and the racial exclusions determined our conversation for many years. 2015, 2016 asked a slightly different question, not who gets into the university, but who do we teach? Who, who do we teach for? What do we want our universities to stand for? What does it mean to be a university in Africa after apartheid and this is the the series of questions that the book explores through what i call predicaments of knowledge that is to say each of these moments of debate offer us both possibilities but also things to be cautious about so for example we have to think about what it means to be a university in africa does that mean we only consider issues on the african continent or is it about thinking the world from africa how do we equip ourselves with the skills to think the world from Africa. Secondly, where do we draw most of our sources of knowledge? We know that historically we see a certain part of the world as producing most of the knowledge in the world and we are the consumers historically of that knowledge. We know through our colonial history that there were ideas driven by Europeans that claim to have m invented the modern world as we know it and we are bystanders of that process in most of the history books that we read. So it's a question of how do we destabilize that? How do we rethink who produces knowledge? How do we affirm both our history and ourselves and our students as producers of knowledge? And where do we get that knowledge from? We get it from knowledge left out of the formal university training and teaching and curriculum, African knowledge in particular in our case, but we also get it from parts of the world that also were colonized, parts of South Asia, parts of Latin America, parts of the Middle East, where there are very alive traditions of knowledge also excluded. So it's a great opportunity for us to become truly global, or as I say, truly universal, by looking at how we incorporate all these other sources of knowledge into what we teach. So those are some of the questions I think that I pose in the book, some of the challenges that lie ahead for us, some of the debates that we should be having amongst ourselves and some of the momentum that we should be continuing after the impetus from the students, which was so important at the time. And also, can you tell us how institutions of modernity might be taught? So I think what, we, what we're dealing with at this current moment is a very interesting one in the world where for a, for a generation in the modern university, as I describe it, which is often said to be in the form we know it with its disciplines like history, sociology, divisions of the faculties between humanities, social sciences, and the natural sciences. This is a very relatively recent way in, in which humans have been organizing knowledge and transmitting knowledge and consuming knowledge and producing knowledge. But it is a model of the university, what is called the Humboldt in model after the, the, the German theorist who had developed that idea. It, it is a model of the university that divides society up into discrete disciplines and you think about particular problems. It is a model of the university which says that it is driven by science, that science drives progress and technology drives progress. And of course, we live in that world. We're very much in the, in the midst of that world. But we must also remember that its claims initially, and an important part of its rationale, 
was to produce a different kind of world and in some ways produce a better world. That was something it claimed very strongly for itself. It, it was a claim of Western civilization. It was a claim of modernity. And it was a claim that justified, for example, colonialism or, or denigrating other people's knowledges by saying, if you incorporate this knowledge, if you read these texts, if you go to the university and learn in this particular way, you are going to be producing a modern world that is better. Now, the question for us today, which we are confronting, is have we made a better world? We look at the, you know, how the natural environment is speaking to us very loudly that mm -hmm. the world that we have created through a particular form of modernity, through mass industrialization, through particular kinds of uses of science and technology, has in fact you know, as we commandeer nature for the purposes of humans, we realize we went a little askew and we went a little overboard, perhaps, in the sense of not thinking adequately about our place in the world in relation to nature, in relation to other beings. And we are biological beings that are dependent on certain aspects of the natural environment. We need clean air, we need clean water, we need food to eat. And here we are sitting on the brink of a, of a catastrophe in terms of the biosphere, in terms of nature. So our mass industrialization has polluted our rivers. Our in development through commercial agriculture has put a lot of chemicals into the soil, etc. We know there's a lot of knowledge that was marginal at one point, but is now growing the mainstream. We, know we have international agencies recognizing the importance of climate change and commitments to reduce carbon emissions as part of those missions. But we, we have to say what knowledge and what claims about modern knowledge and modern institutions uh, that we study in or that we think about or that we have created might have contributed to that. And we have to face with humility the question that perhaps the knowledge that the West claimed to be the best has not produced the best kinds. I wouldn't say we need to get rid of modernity. I, I would say we need to rethink modernity and we need to develop different accounts of modern institutions and modern knowledge from those parts of the world which were often seen to be behind, underdeveloped, backward. Now we know, for example, you know, ways of doing agriculture in Africa that was once seen as primitive is now the sustainable forms of agriculture. So we're turning back to that knowledge. We're looking at plant forms and seeing how we fight diseases, not through the biomedical, uh, you know, automatically turn to biomedicine. So again, it's an exciting opportunity for new and different knowledge that was considered not to be modern, to become part of modernity and <coughs> to become part of our modern institutions. To go back to the original point I was making, to make a better world. And in your book, you critique the current university system for maintaining colonial legacies. So how do you think the system can evolve to better address the needs of the marginalized students? I think firstly, within universities, there are two things I think it's quite important to think about. Of course, we know institutions by their nature, we create them, uh, we put in place rules, we organize them in particular ways, they are governed in particular ways. And they're slow moving in the sense of change. They respond to change slowly. They need to be thoughtful about change. It's good that institutions are thoughtful and reflective. And at the same time, that can also produce sensibilities inside of institutions which make those who manage them very defensive when they are challenged. And we saw that most explicitly when the students revolted. Uh, you know, and institutions responded to that differently. Some vice chancellors and managements and senior colleagues and professors responded uh, more openly to it to embrace the challenge that was being put forward. Others responded slightly uh, defensively. In some cases, we saw the police being called in. So institutions will be contested spaces. And in order for us to continue to ask what institutions can do for the good of the society and the planet because I think we realize that it's not just about the particular society we live in. We're all interconnected and we need a planetary form of knowledge that truly speaks and engages with the majority of people in the world. It's a question of reorganizing those institutions. And the first step, I think, when we all engage with this is to have these as conversations, to be open to the conversation because... Even amongst academics, we can all be set in our ways. We, we have particular knowledge we have been trained in. 
and yet we have colleagues as I described a uh, project we had to rethink political theory and philosophy when I was at the University of the Western Cape it was a moment where colleagues from seven universities who are teaching political philosophy we brought them together and we said you know we've been teaching this content it's assumption is that philosophy of this kind and the modern thinking on the state and democracy and equality only comes from European thinkers. How do we, how do we diversify the way we think about this history? And many colleagues in the room at first were a bit skeptical and at the same time through conversations became persuaded that in fact we have to change what we teach. And then the question was, but how do we change? We've all been trained we are the products of a system that has trained us. We've read certain books. W there are things we haven't read. There are things that we don't know. So what we need, I would say, to sum it up, and as I describe in the book, is to think about how we train the trainers. How do we both rethink what we teach and help the colleagues who are currently our professors and our teachers in our universities to workshop ideas, to introduce new ideas, to bring in new scholars from outside, to bring in new knowledge, but also, most importantly, of course, is to produce a new generation. That, I think, is where our, our hope is going to lie, is that we, we have to produce a generation who are going to become the professors and the teachers of our universities in the future. And I would say that the importance of the humanities and the social science in that endeavor is crucial because they are the ones in universities who drive the conversation about knowledge production that help the scientists, that help the colleagues in engineering, that help the colleagues in commerce to not only think about particular ways in which you manage the economy or you manage the physical structures or you manage natural science, but what its ethical implications are for the world, about what the history of that knowledge is that humans have created that you know can take us in one direction or another. So those larger questions, it's really important to have that dialogue rather than continue the separate silos in which the universities tend to function, the dialogues across the faculties, the dialogues between scientists and the humanities scholars are really important. And I would say those are the kinds of forms of knowledge, the way we organize our daily practice of teaching and research and conversation that we, that we can make changes. And they're not huge changes, but they will be important changes. And please tell us about the predicaments between particularity and universality. This is a very controversial and in some ways important debate and it goes to the kind of on the one hand questions about the university is a site of in its original formulation in the Humboldtian form of universal knowledge. That is to say it it opens us up to the world. It's uh, it's what the what Kant might have described as a cosmopolitanism that was so important to it. And at the same time, as we aspire to this cosmopolitanism, this universal embrace of the university's potential, we realize those of us who are not seen as producers of knowledge historically, if you were from Africa or you're from Asia or you're from Latin America, from the Middle East, you realize that what was presented to you as a universal is in fact a European form of knowledge was European knowledge. It, it claimed for itself the status of being universal. And the rest of us were confined to these particular stories. So if you take the mainstream disciplines, universal knowledge like philosophy was taught in philosophy. But when you looked at the ideas of people in Africa, if you take the Dogon people in Mali's ideas about the stars, which predate Carl Sagan's ideas about astronomy, or the sand people of the Cape, for example, and knowledge about plants and so on, that knowledge is confined to anthropology. It's particular knowledge. You learn it outside of the mainstream disciplines. So what we would have to do is to trouble our understanding of the relationship between the universal and the particular. That too, as I describe in, in the chapter six on, on science, which came out of my engagement with a number of u different universities and people in the science faculties, where you would often hear colleagues say that the idea of decolonizing knowledge and of rethinking Eurocentrism and opening it up to diverse sources is very important, they would say. But it doesn't affect the sciences because the atom is the atom. Wherever you split it, it's the same. And it's very dangerous, they would say, to tinker with that universal knowledge. 
the laws of science. We don't want to tinker with that. Of course, we know we build structures. We don't want our bridges to collapse because we are decolonizing mathematics and formulas in all kinds of ways. So there's a danger to it or medical knowledge that, you know, we must be cautious about what kinds of thinking we introduce, which things that are think thought of as mythology rather than science. And these are important debates and conversations. And what I try to point out is that sometimes it's not so much about replacing one kind of knowledge with another, but really to tell the story differently. So with science, we can say that there's a universal kind of content to some of the modern scientific knowledge. If you take algebra, for example, as I describe it in the book. But let's think about how algebra tells its history and narrates its story. We don't learn often a story of, of mathematics and algebra that says it's not simply a European invention. We learn it as the product of the Enlightenment. We learn it as the product of that moment of the Renaissance in, in European history when religious knowledge was, was replaced with scientific knowledge, right? Yet we don't learn the story of the preceding years, a thousand years, where from the Dark Ages to then, the texts that became the basis of that knowledge for Europeans was in fact text translated into Arabic in parts of the Middle East, entire schools of thought that debated to the extent, of course, that the name itself, algebra, has its root in Arabic and in the Al. So I'm just citing one example of this, that it's not about replacing mathematics as we know it necessarily, it's about narrating the story differently that allows others to be part of this universal story. To say, actually, we were never really particular. All knowledge is actually based on sources that traveled around the world, that were translated, that were borrowed. But the problem is, at a particular point in our recent history, some people said that they invented a lot of things. And when they claim that invention as their universal invention, it left out the contributions of many, many other peoples over thousands of years. So what we would want to do is to say, look, it's fine that this is what we have, and it's great that we have this knowledge today, but let's think about who created it. We, in fact, are all part of it. We are not just the particular marginal parts of the story. We are co-creators of universal knowledge as we know it. So that's uh, what I argue in the book is how we, we should engage with some of those debates about universalism. And what advice would you give to students, especially those from marginalized communities who want to engage with or challenge the current knowledge structures within the universities? It's a very exciting moment for students because I think there's an openness. When, when many of us and generations before us entered into the university during apartheid, during the decades of colonialism on the rest of the African continent, in the few universities, we must remember that Europeans didn't build a lot of universities. They didn't see this modern knowledge as relevant for, for most Africans. At independence, there were very few modern universities. They're really post-colonial creations. It's an exciting moment because we can remake and rethink the university, and students are going to be the agents of that transformation. They're going to be the ones very soon who are going to occupy the spaces, uh, not just as students, but as, as lecturers, as professors, as administrators, as policy makers, and those who remake the society in a better way, one, one hopes. Uh, and that's the hope we all, I think, just have with whatever one's perspective on education. I think we all enter into it also with the hope that we make a better world through it. So it's a very exciting moment. The, what I would say very concretely in South Africa, and I think for many parts of the world, is that we need to think of how we affirm what we bring into the university, the knowledge we already have before we enter into the university, and encourage our institutions to affirm that knowledge so that students are not empty vessels that enter into and have to leave everything they know at the door, but to become to be reshaped and remolded and reformed. This was the old European idea of civilization. What we want is for people to bring what they know and their embodied knowledge into the university. And one important form of that is, is through languages, I would say, that an important challenge that we, that we are confronting and that the institutions are adapting to is that language is not just about communication where we translate one language into another in order to transmit something, but language is also something that carries knowledge within it and that we can affirm different experiences and different knowledges 
by all ourselves encouraging multilingualism in our learning environment. Because one of the things that's quite illuminating about any language when you know you have to learn another language, especially as, as an adult or if you're entering into a space at 17 or 18 or 19 or 20, if you go to another country and, and you are a migrant often or you go to study somewhere or you go to work, and you have to learn another language that's not your mother tongue or even a language not immediately familiar, it makes you feel like a child again. You realize there's a lot of things that you have to be humble about in order to learn that language. And I think when we all have to learn a, a different language in the university, languages of the majority in particular, it will produce less arrogance, more humility amongst those of us who historically have been privileged by apartheid education. So I would say it's an important moment for students also to demand the institutions reflect the multiplicity of knowledges, but also languages through which that knowledge is articulated. And, and it's a moment to, to remake it, and students have to drive that. And lastly, Surian, what are you hoping people take away after reading this book? And how can this book serve as a catalyst for change in higher education? I see the book as, as one amongst many exciting new books that's come out, particularly since 2015, 2016, as part of a conversation and as part of a debate. And what's exciting is that I think we're in a moment where we realize there can be no one answer to the challenge, but I think we can agree to some extent that there is a challenge, that in fact we have inherited an apartheid form of, of knowledge, a colonial form of knowledge. It comes from particular places. We can agree on that, but beyond that, I think we need to be in debate and conversation and discussion, and I see the book as, as entering into that debate and that discussion. It has particular arguments about w how I think, you know, for example, in very concrete terms, if you're teaching the concept like the state, how might you do that differently? But there are other approaches other colleagues might have. So I'm putting forward my view, and these are uh, out of my own experiences and, and, and efforts, and so I see it as part of that exciting dialogue and debate that's unfolding. And I have tried to write that in as accessible a way as I can, because I think often, of course, these can become very rarefied, conceptual, intellectual debates. And I'm not necessarily saying I've escaped some of that, but I d have tried to outline what I think the debates are in as crisp a series of formulations as possible so that it can be a, a conversation and a debate that others enter into. That was Suren Pillay speaking to Criminal Media's policy about predicaments of knowledge.